Hi, this is Julia from the Macedon Public Library in Macedon, New York. Um, it is Monday. I believe this is our seventh, beginning our seventh week of online programs for the My Macedon Library. Um, today, I'm coming with you for something slightly different than I've done before. Um, I'm going to be reading to you from a selection of two very old works. Um, one is the Journal of the Plague Year, which was uh, written and published by Daniel Defoe in 1722. Yes, um, I'll give you give you a little bit more information. And also, I happen to, to and that's so I've been reading that electronically, so that is obviously open source and uh, copyright free. So I've been reading that on the internet, and I also happen to own a copy of Pepys' Diary, um, which was a story of his life uh, in the late 1600s. So both of these are going to be talking about the the Great Plague, the bubonic plague um, that hit London in 1665, um, and as I was reading it, the connections that are interesting to note several hundred years later. Um, and then I was recently um, alerted to uh, a current program uh, website that is available that is based off of that. It's also called the Journal of the Play Year, um, which is collecting resources. So photographs and memories and journal articles and videos um, that are dealing with how we modern people are dealing with our pandemic that is at hand at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna be reading some of the things from the old. I'm gonna be reading some of, the, some of the things from the website that is new. I will share with you how we can be involved and we can help uh, join our feelings and our memories and our experiences um, for this collective world experience. Um, so yeah, so let's get going with that. Um, I think I'm gonna, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of screen sharing today uh, and I'm gonna start, hope, my cat's coming because apparently he wants to join too. So I don't think he can get in front of the computer. I'm going to start sharing my screen first and I'm going to, I'm going to the Wikipedia page. If it will let me share my screen. There we go. And there's my cat. Uh, so, all right. So hopefully you can see this uh, and possibly see me at the same time, I don't know. So this, I'm just gonna be reading a little bit from the, from the Wikipedia page that is uh, talking about the Daniel Defoe Journal of the Plague Year. Uh, it was published in March, 1722 uh, as the account of one man's experience in the year 1665 in which the bubonic plague struck the city of London uh, and what later became known as the Great Plague of London. It's just one of the plagues that swept through. Uh, but this one was the one known as the Great Plague of London, the last epidemic of plague that hit the city. It is told somewhat chrono chronologically, though without selections or chapter headings, and so and it doesn't necessarily go into um, what date or even what month. So uh, versus Samuel Pepys' diary, which is his collection. Uh, it also talks about the Great Fire that hit London the year after, um, and it is a diary, so it is going by month and date. Um, and his experience. So interestingly, uh, this, the, the Daniel Defoe Journal of the Plague Year, he was actually five years old during the plague, so this is not his firsthand experience of the plague. Um, it is kind of a historical fiction, as it's believed to be. Uh, it seems to be, uh, it says it was uh, published under the initials HF, which is possibly based on the journals of his uncle, Henry Foe, uh, who was a saddler, and that is the, the uh, persona of the, the main voice in the Journal of the Plague Year, um, is he's a saddler, saddles for horses and such. Um, so uh, it goes into a great amount of detail in the Journal of the Plague Year as far as numbers, uh, the roles of the deaths that are listed, um, and mentions specific streets. So it's being very careful to to place it specifically in London um, at this time and showing the, the depth of the plague that hit. So let me stop the sharing here. And uh, I think I just lost my notes. Um, so yeah, so let me read a bit. What I'm gonna read to you, I'm reading it from my phone. Um, it is about halfway, maybe 40% 40, 40% of the way through. I actually haven't finished reading yet. We know how it ends. Um, <laughs> obviously, um, a lot of people died, and uh, but people survived and moved on and wrote their own accounts of that. So 
So this is, uh, again, from the persona, persona of the saddler. Um, it says, here I saw a poor man walking on the bank, or seawall, as they call it, by himself. I walked a while also about, seeing the houses all shut up. At last I fell into some talk at a distance with this poor man. First I asked him how people did thereabouts. Alas, sir, says he, almost desolate, all dead or sick. Here are very few families in this part or in that village pointing at Poplar, where half of them are not dead already and the rest are sick. Then he pointed to one house. There they are all dead, said he, and the house stands open. Nobody dares go into it. A poor thief, says he, ventured in to steal something, but he paid dear for his theft, for he was carried to the churchyard too last night. Then he pointed to several other houses. There, says he, they are all dead, the man and his wife and five children. There, says he, they are shut up. You see a watchman at the door, and so of other houses. Why, says I, what do you do here all alone? Why, says he, I am a poor desolate man. It has pleased God I am not yet visited, though my family is, and one of my children dead. How do you mean then, said I, that you are not visited? Why, says he, that is my house, pointing to a very low, little, uh, low boarded house. And there my poor wife and two children live, said he, if they may be said to live. For my wife and one of the children are visited, but I do not come at them. So being visited means they have the symptoms of plague. And with that word, I saw tears run very plentifully down his face, and so they did down mine too, I assure you. But, said I, why do you not come at them? How can you abandon your own flesh and blood? Oh, sir, says he, the Lord forbid, I do not abandon them. I work for them as much as I am able, and blessed be the Lord, I keep them from want. And with that I observed, he lifted up his eyes to heaven with a countenance that presently told me I had happened on a man that was no hypocrite, but a serious religious good man. And his ejaculation was an expression of thankfulness that in such a condition as he was in, he should be able to say his family did not want. Well, says I, honest man, that it's a great mercy as things go now with the poor. But how do you live then? And how are you kept from this dreadful calamity that is now upon us all? Why, sir, says he, I am a waterman, and there is my boat. And, he, and the boat serves me for a house. I work in it in the day, and I sleep in it in the night. And what I get, I lay down upon that stone, says he, showing me a broad stone on the other side of the street, a good way from his house. And then, says he, I halloo and call to them till I make them hear, and they come and fetch it. Well, friend, says I, but how can you get any money as a waterman? Does anybody go by water these times? Yes, sir, says he, in the way I am employed there does. Do you see there? Five ships lie at anchor, pointing down the river a good way below the town. And do you see, says he, eight or ten ships lie at the chain there, and at anchor yonder, he pointed above the town. All those ships have families on board, of their merchants and owners and such like, who have locked themselves up in and live on board, close shut in, for fear of the infection. And I tend on them to fetch things for them, carry letters and do what is absolutely necessary, that they may not be obliged to come on shore. And every night I fasten my boat on board one of the ship's boats, and there I sleep by myself, and blessed be God, I am preserved hitherto. Well, said I, friend, but will they let you come on board after you've been on shore here, when there's such a terrible place and so infected as it is? Why, as to that, said he, I am very seldom go up the ship's side, but I deliver what I bring to their boat on or lie by the side, and they hoist it on board. If I did, I think they are no danger from me, for I never go into any house on shore or touch anybody, no, not of my own family, but I fetch provi provisions for them. And he says, I, but that may be worse, for you must have those provisions of somebody or other. And since all this part of the town is so infected, it is dangerous so much as to speak with anybody for the village, says I, is, as it were, the beginning of London, though it be at some distance from it. That is true, added he, but you do not understand me right. I do not buy provisions from them here. I row up to Greenwich and buy fresh meat there, and sometimes I row down the river to Woolwich. And by there. Then I go to single farmhouses on the Kentish side, where I am known, and I buy fowls and eggs and butter and bring that to the ships, and they direct me sometimes one, sometimes the other. I seldom come on shore here, and I came now only to call on my wife and hear how my family do and give them a little money which I received last night. Poor man, says I. 
And how much have thou gotten for them? I've gotten four shillings, said he, which is a great sum as things go now with the poor man. But they have given me a bag of bread too, and salt fish and some flesh, so all helps out. Well, says I, have you given it to them yet? No, said he, but I have called and my wife has answered that she cannot come out yet, but in half an hour she hopes to come. And I am waiting for her. Poor woman, says he, she is brought sadly down. She has a swelling and it is broke. And I hope she will recover, but I fear the child will die. But it is the Lord. And here he stopped and he wept very much. Well, honest friend, said I, thou hast a sure comforter if thou hast brought thyself to be resigned to the will of God. He is dealing with us all in judgment. I think, I think I'm going to end there. So that's the story of, of the, the main speaker, um, the saddler, who was, he stayed in London um, and he did not leave. Um, many people did leave. So for example, the people who, the merchants who owned the boats, they brought their families um, on board the boat and then wrote, went out at a distance to stay away from the plague as they understood things, that they, um, how things would spread and, and whatnot. And then they hired this man to go uh, and collect them food. So basically he was the essential worker in, in modern terms uh, as they stayed in their cause, um, in their social distance situation. And so he would bring them, he would replenish their food uh, and they would pay him. And then he would go and bring it back to his family who were shut up um, outside of London. So this was even out, so it wasn't in the, the depths of the city. Um, okay, so that is, so that is one person's story of that time. Um, it mentions Wool Woolwich, uh, and so then going to Samuel Pepys's diary. Let me see if I can show you a copy of, picked this up at a book sale when I was in college, almost 30 years ago. Okay, so see if that'll show up. So the di diary of Samuel Pepys, Esquire, uh, from 1659 to 16, 1669 with a memoir. Okay, so this one, as I said, is dated, and it starts, where am I going to start reading? I think um, August 10th, so this is August 10th, 1665. By the by to the office, where we, so he, he was a merchant. Um, he was fairly well off um, and had many great friends that were also well-to-do. Um, so, so he talked often of his business and his relationships with people. By the by, to the office, where we sat all morning in great trouble to see the bill this week rise so high, so that's the count of, of the dead, uh, to above 4,000 in all, and of them above 3,000 of the plague. Home to draw over anew my will, which I had bound myself by oath to dispatch by tomorrow night, the town growing so unhealthy that a man cannot depend upon living two days. This is August 12th. The people die so that now it seems they are fain to carry the dead to be buried by daylight, the nights not sufficing to do it in. And my Lord Mayor commands people to be within at nine at night. Uh, as they say, that the sick may have liberty to go abroad for air. There is one also dead out of one of our ships at Deptford, he was a ship owner, um, which troubles us mightily. The Providence fire ship, which was just fitted to go to sea, but they tell me today no more sick are on board. And this day, Mr. Bottom tells me that one is dead at Woolwich, not far from the rope yard. I am told, too, that a wife of one of the grooms at court is dead at Salisbury, so that the king and queen are speedily all gone to Milton. So God preserve us. Uh, August 15th, it was dark before I could get home and so land at churchyard stairs, where to my great trouble, I met a dead core of the plague in the narrow alley, just bringing down a little pair of stairs. But I thank God I was not much disturbed at it. However, I shall be aware of being laid abroad again. The uh, August 16th, to the exchange, where I have not been a great while. But Lord, how sad a sight it is to see the streets empty of people and very few upon the change, the exchange. Jealous of every door that one sees shut up, lest it should be the plague. And about us, every two shops and three, if not more, generally are shut up. 
This day I had the nil ill news from Dagenham is that my poor lord of Hitchinbroke, his indisposition is turned to the smallpox. Poor gentleman, that he should be come from France so soon to fall sick, and of that disease too, which he should be gone to see a fine lady, his mistress. I am most heartily sorry for it. I'm going to skip ahead now to August 22nd. I went away and walked to Gren Greenwich, Green Greenwich, I guess it is, in my way, seeing a coffin with a dead body therein, dead of the plague, laying in an open close belonging to the Coombe Farm, which was carried out last night. And the parish have not appointed anybody to bury it, but only set a watch there all day and night that nobody should go thither or come thence. This disease making us more cruel to one another than we are to dogs. August 25th. This day I am told that Dr. Burnett, my physician, is this morning dead of the plague, which is strange. His man dying so long ago and his house this month open again. Now himself dead. Poor unfortunate man. August 28th. I think to take a do today of the London streets. In much the best posture I ever was in my life, both as to the quantity and the certainty I have of the money I am worth, having most of it in my hand. But then this is the trouble to me, which I, what I do with it, being myself this day going to be wholly at Woolwich. But for the present, I am resolved to venture in, in an iron chest, at least for a while. Making sure he's bringing his money with him. Um, and he's ready to go. So I'm going to leave our old, the history of the play there. So in there we heard about uh, numbers again. We heard about uh, leaving London and we heard about the king and queen who had left London um, during times of plague. They would go in, out into the countryside um, where it was believed to be healthier uh, and they would have more protection. Uh, but like a groomsman of the court having died, um, someone who's worked on a ship that he, that he was one of the owners of um, has died, but the other people in the ship, his personal physician has died now of the plague who uh, had a servant earlier who had died and then they would have a certain period that the house is shut up and then open it up when nobody else gets sick. So it had been a month open and then the physician himself um, dies of the plague. So, so that is, that is that, which, so that, that bubonic plague is not what we're dealing with right now, but the same kind of situations for containing it and um, the impact on the people. So now let's go ahead to this newest, um, experience that uh, is out there that we can all participate in that is also called the Journal of the Plague Year. I first came up across it because last week I guess there was a Storyteller Day, a National Storyteller Day or something, and um, one of the senator, New York senators that I follow, um, Senator Biaggi, I think it was, who I think is around in the Bronx area, I think it's the 34th district. Anyway, she's not our, she's not our senator here, but I follow her emails. Um, she made reference of um, this opportunity to become part of the storytellers telling our own story in, in, the, in this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And I followed the link and I found this website. So I'm gonna share this now. Put my glasses back on. All right. And I could get, All right, so I don't want that page anymore. We can close that. So this is a Journal of the Plague Year, an archive of COVID-19. Um, so we're gonna come back to this again at the very end, but the very first tab that they have there is share your story. And it walks you through how you can participate. Anybody can participate. This is a Creative Commons website. So that what you present needs to be your own, uh, but there's no copyright. You're not like typing in something from um, a newspaper article or from a book. You're not taking anybody else's copyrighted material. You agree that this is something that you've created and that you are sharing it willingly um, with the world. Uh, so that's part of what this is. You can upload images. There are a lot of photographs. Um, you can share website information. Uh, it wants to know who originally created it describe it, and then you can also say where, not just in the United States, because there's things from all over the world, and you can pinpoint where you are, and then they check they check it up. So there are 
curators from this uh, that work on this. And there's a bunch of people, I would say maybe, maybe 40 or 50. Um, and interestingly, looking through the list, there are two people who, and it's academic. Um, it began as a way for, for students um, to participate or, or to create, I guess, in the creation of the website and then to maintain it historically um, as memoirists and things like that, uh, chroniclers. And um, so there are, so the people who are the curators are the people who kind of go and make sure that in fact, you are a real person who's sharing this, um, that this isn't spam in any way, it's nothing malicious. Uh, and then it is actually owned by the person who is submitting it so that there's no copyright infringement. Um, and two of the curators uh, currently are uh, faculty or members of RIT locally. And another one is uh, from Hobart. So we have three people working on the website that are local. And I thought that was pretty cool. OK, so that's how you share. Oh, let's go back to this. You can browse items and just see what is available. Let's see, actually, if you go back to the beginning, um, they highlight some featured things. And then it kind of goes into things the most recent. Um, this looks like, like I said, there's a lot of photographs. Um, and you can just come here and spend all hours. I think there's 56 pages of list of, of a list of what is here. Um, so let's see, let's see what this is. A photograph called Talking to a Friend. A photograph taken as I talked to my friend through her window. I was on a walk and saw the open window as I passed her apartment. I called up to her and we spoke for a little while. She's been self-quarantining because a family member uh, who she saw last week has coronavirus. So far, she has not shown any symptoms. So this was published, this was shared here March 22nd. And then down here, you can come in and see Boston is where the photo is coming from. And there's the friend. And that's how that's how we kind of have conversations with our friends now. If 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 it's in person, it's more likely to be that way. Rather, I could also be obviously on the phone or an email or in a text. Um, you can also uh, browse in items by the map. So you can click on the map and keep clicking, and it will show you where people have submitted things. So here is one, there's one or two that I wanted to share here from, from the Buffalo area. So this is a text message. I've heard mixed reports from Wegmans this morning. A friend went right at six when they opened and said it was chaotic. Uh, response, downtown Wegmans was nuts Thursday. Oh, I'm sure people are, are losing their minds. Uh, and then I'm about to walk by your house, come stand on your porch and say hi. So the description is snippets of a text message conversation capturing information about the state of grocery stores and a call for a friend to come out on their porch to say hi from a safe distance away. And again, this is from the Buffalo area, March 21st. I think this was probably soon after um, the stores were uh, closing overnight for cleaning and then opening at six. And I think six to seven was just for seniors and people who are compromised. Um, I'm not even sure if that's still going on. So that was that. Also from the Buffalo area. Come on, give me the, there we go. There was also a grocery list. Just pictures of grocery and it's kind of breaking things down. Wegmans, BJ's, staples to have on hand. Uh, it says, trying to minimize trips to the store, think about what staples we have in the house and how to stretch them, a dramatic change from my usual system of planning what we want to eat and shopping for those ingredients. So again, this is just another sign of how things have changed um, for individuals. I think there's one more thing that I wanted to look at that was on the map that was a video. So you kind of always kind of have to keep <laughs> clicking through. And I think this one was from Cooperstown here, yes. So this is a father and daughter singing, uh, performing the song from Annie, which of course um, 
they don't they didn't write the song or own it but it is their performance of it they first posted it on facebook as a, in a series of uplifting songs they posted it the 16th of march they even have a, a transcription and i'll play a little bit of it i hope you can hear it I hope I can that. all right uplifting songs day one and i love annie <laughs> The sun will come down tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow till there's none. All right, we're gonna end it there. So there's a video clip of someone sharing how they how they're getting through this, uh, and there are some longer pieces. So I went ahead and pulled this one out because I thought this was very interesting. Um, this one is called "Family, Friends, Illness, Fear, Frustration, and Joy: A COVID-19 Journal from March through April." Um, started March 15th, um, and this is somebody who writes in a journal on a regular basis. Uh, but the details, and it's lovely that she's sharing it. I believe she is in the Washington DC area, yes, uh, in, in Northside. So this is her experiences, she and her husband. Um, and this is a 27 page document that is posted, um, which is very lovely to see. Uh, if you go through, she's talking about her, her self and her husband and her a uh, daughter who lives nearby and uh, their young son um, during this period, he's having a birthday. Um, she's also so looking at in the, the historical records talked about the deaths and the numbers. Um, she does often mention that the evening's figures. Um, again, today's numbers. At one point, she starts not feeling well, and she recaps the things that she had mentioned earlier um, about some illness, some symptoms that she was feeling. And uh, in February, she had some things going on, uh, seemed like a cold, lingering cough. Um, they babysat at one point for the three-year-old grandson. Um, Brandon had a bad Old daughter and the grandson both sick. March 15th woke up with cold symptoms. Four days after exposure, sore throat, dry cough that eventually became wet, sneezing a little runny nose, not bad. Even so, Kay and I walk a couple of miles on trails through Paintbrush Paint Branch Park. That evening throat hurting, not sore as such, but painful in a different way. Swollen glands, uh, keeping track of her temperature. She is 97.9. Uh, March 16th told Kay, that's her husband, that I can't smell or taste food. My favorite oatmeal tastes like cardboard. March 17th, couldn't sleep last night because of a cough. Not dry, but not coughing up a lot, although it is yellow-green. Can't taste or smell food. Temperatures throughout the day, 98.99, um, 98.6 um, upon waking the next day. Coughing with plums, slightly burning feeling in top of lungs and fatigue, no shortness of breath. So she goes on about different things. She didn't bother to take her temperature. At a certain point, um, she calls the doctor. She shares this information with him. And then they set up a video appointment for two o'clock. He was all excited, the doctor, because it was his first video appointment. I gave him the symptom list above in advance of the appointment. Here's an email he sent afterwards and it talks about uh, that she may have had COVID, um, about the symptoms, the whole thing that talking about the, the not tasting food, um, that, that while fever is a very strong sign that it is not necessary. You don't always uh, show a fever um, with COVID-19 if your symptoms aren't that extreme. Um, they, but they said stay home, don't, you know, so she was never tested. Um, and other things kind of came up. So, and then they paid off their mortgage. So it's, this is a life of somebody who's going through all of this. Um, and it goes all the way up through, whoops, wrong one. Uh, I believe, yep, Thursday, April 30th. Um, and there's the, the numbers uh, reported. Um, uh, yesterday, Dr. Fauci 
Fauci, uh, White House Task Force, announced that the study on the antiviral medication Remdesivir has been overseeing as head of NIAID, NIAID, and NIH is showing positive results. This is huge news because this is the first gold standard study, double blind with control group receiving placebo that had been done on this drug. Um, some, her daughter working in that area, they actually had been part of that first part of the study. Um, it's showing things. She talks about her own personal health for the past several days. She's had lingering symptoms. Um, she, doesn't, she has her energy back, but she might still be fighting whatever it is. Um, she's never been tested. She doesn't know. Um, she's still taking her temperature every day. And this is just, again, a person going through this. I'm going to stop that. Oh, no, I'm not going to stop the share yet. So let me go to back over here, up to the, now I'm going to go to here. I think it's going to be faster. And then to share your story. So this is where you would have something. So if you want to make a little journal note, or if you want to uh, take a photograph, um, I showed you the photograph at the beginning about the, the windows. Oh, this is a nice one. This is, um, I believe, in Australia of uh, daughters that are drawing and leaving notes and happiness. You know how people have been putting bears in their windows and rainbows and things. So they've been leaving messages uh, for people who are driving by to stay safe uh, with love and rainbows and all of that. Um, drawing pictures of hope and happiness on our front gate to join the teddy bear hunt. So, so if you have any pictures that you want to share, or if you have thoughts or memories, or a favorite song that you've been singing that keeps your spirits up, somebody was in there, their uh, people's um, yoga um, meditations that they do to help keep them focused. It also could be, uh, there's a story, lots of stories, because it did kind of start as an academic project. There are stories of, um, pictures of of dorms when as as the schools were saying you have to get out you have to get all your stuff and you have to get out now kind of the chaos of that uh, or students congregating in the greens to have one last big party before they all have to go home which um, the person who posted it kind of commented it was good to have done that but it seems so socially inappropriate at this point um, that they didn't understand how bad that could have been it might have been who knows uh, with contract contact tracing um, There's just a lot, uh, there's a lot of different things and um, it is just kind of starting out. And so um, the more people that participate, the larger the picture that we will leave behind um, as this repository of what we're going through at the time. And so I think it would be really awesome if we could get some people from our area. So far, there's nobody, there's nobody even from Rochester that have uh, put in their information. There's uh, one picture from Geneva, uh, which is talking about um, the campus there and how quiet um, the buildings are in Geneva uh, from school now that the, the college is closed. And um, I shared the, the song from Cooperstown, um, the mother, the father and daughter. And then there's things from the three things from Buffalo. Um, but we need to get somebody from this area. So I think I'm, I'm trying to think about what I could put up there. Um, and I would love to hear if others do it too, uh, or even just go and just see how other people are going through this. Um, there's a lot of things from Arizona and um, the west, western part of the country as well. And there are from all over the world. Um, so yeah, so I recommend it. And um, it's just another way to see a context. So the world has gone through these sorts of things before and will go through these sorts of things again. Um, but everyone's personal journey is different and important and um uh, and has meaning and can help others get through this all right and i think i'm gonna leave it there so again uh, if you're interested in reading daniel defoe's journal of the plague year it is you can find it uh, project gutenberg um i'm actually reading it through an app that i use on my phone that is called serial reader and um, it is a free app and uh the it's a one-man uh creator of the the app and he um, is awesome. You can even suggest things that are out of copyright and he will dig them up and find them and put them in. And he breaks things down into smaller reading chunks. 
Yes, I work in a library. Yes, I love to read. I'm a very slow reader. Um, so I love that it breaks it down into maybe 15 minutes of reading per day. Um, and then you can read ahead if you want, or you can, you, you can even postpone if you don't get your reading done for the day. So that's how I've been reading the Journal of the Plague here. I read it about 15 minutes a day. I'm about halfway through. Um, then there's also, I mentioned the Samuel Pepys Diary. So again, that is from the same plague experience, um, talking about how people were handling it. And then we have this. So this is the website if you want to go visit it. I, let's see if you can see it. Uh, HTTPS COVID19.omeka.net. Uh, it is um, Creative Commons. So it is free and available. Um, put things up there that are yours that you have the right to post. And uh, yeah, we'll do this. All right. Hope everyone's staying well and, and moving on. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.